the best old-time radio from people you trust. The Radio Nostalgia Network, where the oldies are still young. The story of the violence that moved westward with young America. The story of one man who moved with it. Mark Dillon, United States Marshal. They all drifted here to Dodge City, one time or another. The buffalo killers, the saddle bums, the spoilers. The end of the track and the start of the wilderness. The dumping ground of odds and ends and beginnings and leftovers. The place to stop and take the kind of pleasure you need. The place to pass through, and sometimes it's a place to die. My part of it was a sun-baked shack, rent paid by the United States government, and the marshal's badge, furnished free. I was at the window watching the heat plump itself with Kansas dust and roll in towards the town when the door opened. Your name's Dylan? You the United States marshal? She was about 50, poke bonnet, demon dress beaded Indian moccasins for shoes. He said there was a steady marshal here in Dodge City. Been living for six months running. <laughs> They've been lying to you. Four months. They say you and your gun can break a man's heart at 50 yards. It's on your mind. I want you to saddle up and get down to Gaujai. Why? My husband. He owns the white buffalo there. Roulette, music, drinks. They say the roulette wheel's crooked. I'll tell you what to do. There's a fellow here in Dodge City named a Sin Killer Stokes. Saves souls by the bushel. Trumpet playing and everything. You tell Sin Killer about your husband. In Gaja, they kill a man who runs a crooked wheel. I don't want my husband dead. Well, look, ma'am, I don't even Abigail know Abigail you... Contuarius. That's my name. Yeah, well... Mrs. Contuarius, you don't need a marshal. You need an honest husband. He's no more crooked than you are. If he was, I wouldn't take none of his money. Sure. Don't sure me, marshal. Money don't just mean money to me means books for Indian kids and writing stuff. Slates and all. Oh, a missionary. Huh, me? With a gambler and a philanderer and a toper for a husband? I teach Indian kids. Teach them to behave and a little learning, that's all. Well, that's good work, ma'am. These towns could use more people like you. Don't sniff around me. You marshals are supposed to mean law and order and the rights of decent people. Dodge, I could use some of that. You coming or do I have to ride my mule some more? Ride it back to Gauge, I... I'll be along. Make it soon, Marshal. There'll be a convulsion down there if you don't. It was night when the town of Gaujai loomed out of the wilderness and beckoned to me like a painted, skinny hag. If Dodge City had a sister, this was it. I rode up to the white buffalo, started to tie my horse to a hitching post, twiddled to the shape of a Pawnee girl, when suddenly the gun in my back told me I wasn't alone. You won't like it here in Gaujai, Marshal. Pretty as it is, you won't like it. No? No. Don't turn around, Marshal. I'm shy. I'm modest. I embarrass easy. Isn't that so, Harold? <laughs> See? Harold thinks it's so. Harold had his tongue clipped. Apaches. Maybe it was too long. Oh, that's not a genteel thing to say to Harold, Marshal. He takes offense easy. I'm new here. Back in Dodge City, the etiquette's a little more formal. Then go back to Dodge. We're happy here in Gaujai, like little birds. You could spoil it. I was invited. Special invitation. Yeah? Well, the dance is over. Now, Harold, now. I told you you wouldn't like it in Gaujai, Marshal. <laughs> When I opened my eyes, I was in Gaujai's dirt. I knew I'd never forget that voice and that crazy giggle. I picked myself up and waited till the town stopped its dizzy dance. On the third time around, I spotted a horse trough and stuck my head in it to get rid of the blood on my face. I finally pushed my bones through the swinging doors of the white buffalo. 
A girl leaned against the bar, strumming a guitar. Black hair, slender. And something profane and exquisite was distilled into her features. She watched me across the room. And when she spoke, it was as if she hadn't quit singing. Buenos noches, Chico. Evening. Oh, a marshal. A marshal with a cup face and a muddy badge. <laughs> you buy girls drinks, marshal? Here's a buck. Buy yourself one. Where can I find the owner? Over there by the poker table. Which one? The goatee and pompadour. Thanks. Come back to me, Chico. They call me Tama. Tama, huh? Maybe I will. <laughs> Your name, Contrarius? Si. Oh, the marshal from Dodge City. <laughs> you already have the look of a large headache, senor. Yeah? Someone else besides you and your wife is expecting me. Muy mal. Too bad. It wasn't good. No, oh, I see. But I am glad you have come, senor marshal. Come, look around. See my place. I have a magnificent establishment here. No? Yes. No. Yes. You know, it would grieve me if I had to part with it. It'd grieve Mrs. Contrarius more, and for a better reason. Senora Contrarius hates it how I get my money, but she takes it for the Indian children. Looks like the take plenty. No. Every day my wheel loses money. Somebody is swindling me. This somebody, I swear it, I will kill you dead. Your wife hinted it might be you who'd be killed dead. <laughs> no one has killed me yet. This I tell myself, and it makes me happy. Yeah. Now, well, let's have a look at this wheel of yours. Of course. Follow me. You see, I have also Pharaoh, Dye, Girl, uh, Dancing Girl, mm -hmm. and the finest little west of the Mississippi. Number 12. Red face, 12 days. Where's your spinner? I will introduce you to him. Greg. Senor. Un momento. William will take your place. Yes, Mr. Contrarius. Greg Hagen, the best croupier in the territory. Greg, I want you to meet Mark Dillon, Marshal of the United States of America. I've heard your name, Dillon. You're from Dodge City. Lately from there. Uh, go count your chips, Contrarius. Hagen and I want to talk. Yes, I leave you gentlemen at all. We want to talk, Marshal? Yeah. Rumor has it the wheel's rigged. Mrs. Contrarius tell you to ask? Maybe. Well, is it? Look, Marshal. Contrarius is my friend. Still, a croupier's in a mighty good spot to double-cross the house. Marshal, I already told you, Contrarius is my friend. Sorry, I made a mistake. No hard feelings? Plenty hard feelings. I think I like it better back at the table. Look around yourself, Marshal. So, I did. Mostly, I hung around the roulette table. And as far as I could see, the wheel was given the house and the customers an even break. Just about the time I was ready to go out and find Contrarius again, two new players wandered up to the crowded table. One in a beaded jacket, the other a silent hulk of a man. They didn't seem to be together or even know each other. On the next spin, the ball fell into 29, bounced out, rolled around 13, and finally settled in double O. Just as it did, beaded jacket reached out and put a $100 bill on double O. Greg Hagan, the croupier, looked up. I'm sorry, mister, you placed your bet after the ball settled. The house can't accept it. I had that $100 down before you started to spin. Ask anybody. I had it down. I want to ask the people. I'm telling you, I had it down. Look, mister, your bet wasn't legitimate. The house recommends you take your money and get out. He did. Fast. Too fast. In another second, I knew the reason why. When Beaded Jacket picked up the bill, there was a blue chip under it on double O, and the house paid off to the silent house. I knew I'd heard Beaded Jacket's voice before. When I first hit town, so I moved fast. I got out of the casino just in time to see Beaded Jacket disappear around the corner. I took it easy. Polite and easy. The bullet nubbed the dust at my feet. I ducked into the shadows and whipped out my gun. The flash should come from a narrow passageway between two buildings. I'm in this alley, Marshal. Come on in and get me. Wait right there. I'm waiting. I'll strike a match. I want to see your face when it happens to you. Try me. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> you shoot first. You'll miss, you know that, Marshal. But I won't. Because your gun flash will tell me where you are. Real clever. That was clever what you did back at the White Buffalo. 
Honest Injun. <laughs> Tell me about it. You and your friend. That was Harold, huh? The giggle with the talent for pistol whipping? Tell me all about it. You throw down a $100 bill with a blue chip underneath it after the ball drops. You get yourself thrown out. Harold, who never made a bet at all, collects 35 to 1. Oh, did Harold do that? Did you do that, Harold? <laughs> and there he was, framed in the entrance of the alley. I was caught between them. Beaded jacket and a mute called Harold. The big guns in Harold's hands turned over and over. His face held all the evil in the world. You're right, Harold. Take him. He was shooting waist high along the wall, and he was getting close. There was only one thing to do, and I couldn't miss. You shot Harold Marshall. That was your mistake. shoulder, and from across a smoldering campfire, I saw her, Tamar. The morning sun lighted up the features of a man at her feet, Senor Rafael Ramon Jose Contuarius. The bullet hole in his forehead gave him an extra flourish. Now it was Senor Rafael Ramon Jose Contuarius, deceased, and the girl named Tamar was singing a love song. Back to Gunsmoke in just a moment. Combining modern detective methods with secrets of the mysterious East, the Green Llama offers CBS listeners a new thrill now on Sundays. Once he has heard of a crime or an injustice, Jethro Dumont, a wealthy young American just returned from ten years in Tibet, brings into play his quick wit and knowledge of illusion to thwart the evildoers. Join him Sundays as he continues his fight against crime on this side of the Pacific, wearing green, the color of Tibetan justice. Aided by Tulku, his trusted lieutenant. The Green Llama is a feature presentation of most of these same CBS stations. And now back to Mark Dillon, United States Marshal, and Gunsmoke. When they pinned the Marshal's badge on me, they said I had a job to do. This morning, my job was a man with a bullet hole in his forehead and a marshal with a wound in his shoulder. The dead man was Rafael Ramon Jose Contuarius. And the marshal was me. And there was a girl named Tamar. You have slept long, Chico, without dreams. How do you know there were no dreams, Tamar? Because I saw death give you a little piece of himself. And then right away on his black pony. Yeah, I'm lucky. How did I get here? Senor Contuarius and I brought you here. The wagon over there in the borough. You are muy lucky, Chico. The bullet was for your heart, but it spent itself in your shoulder. It was not your time to die. But it was Contuarius's time to die, huh? Perhaps his grave has been empty too long. And you knew him well? See, si, I knew him. Well enough to kill him? I did not kill him. In your Contuarius was my protector. What did he protect you from? Himself? I like your mouth better when it is gentle, Chico. Then who did kill him? I do not know. While we were here trying to help you, a bullet came out of the darkness and found Contuarius. How come you picked this place? It is a place in your Contuarius and I knew well. Oh, like that, huh? It is a place where Senor Booth would not look for you if he knew you were still alive. Booth? So that's his name, the man in the beaded jacket. How come he didn't finish me? When we heard the shot, Senor Contuarius and I ran out of the white buffalo. I, uh, persuaded Senor Booth that you were dead. Booth persuades easy, huh? <laughs> he persuades easy for Tomar. The shots were heard, people came. Senor Booth does not like too much attention. Well, he's going to get all of mine, Tomar. Undivided. I don't advise it, Chico. If you live, go back to Dodge City. 
If you die, die in Dodge City. Oh, wait. The senior Contuarius and the Burro car. Oh. Where is he? Where is he? Answer me, woman. Answer me. There, senora. Behind the marshal. The marshal? <laughs> Hello, marshal. They said you'd been killed. Get up, Contuarius. Get up. He's... He's dead, ma'am. Oh. He shouldn't be lying there on the cold ground. I'll lift him up into the car. I will help you, Senora. If you so much as touch him, I'll kill you. Come along. Go and fly. You're pretty strong to lift him yourself. I've done it before. You're hurt, Marshal? I'll be all right. You can come too if you want. Take you back to town. Look, ma'am, I'm sorry about... Sorry? Huh. You should never have left Dodge City. All it got me was a dead husband. Get in. Somewhere on that long wagon ride back to town, Mrs. Contuarius squeezed a tear onto her cheek. Just one tear. But for her, it was a major emotion. The sun was doing its best to char the wood frame buildings when we hit Gaujai. She drove past the white buffalo to the far edge of town, pulled up at a tar paper shack. Oh. Here we are, Marshal. Why bring me here? Just so I could pick my own gutter? Why didn't you leave me in the cottonwoods to die? That door. That shack door right over there. Try it. All right, ma'am. Get in. I heard you were dead. Hey, you're hurt. Come on in. Thanks. Who sent you here? Mrs. Contorius. Huh? You better cut away that shirt. Why'd she send me here, Greg? Not neat, Marshal. Not neat at all. I hear, Greg. Lie still. I'll get some things. You haven't answered my question. I do things with my hands, Marshal. Spin roulette with you. And they strike bullets between spins. You a doc? Yeah, I'm a doc. Was. Had a shingle. Nice, shiny one. And they said I couldn't have it anymore. Now, practice, they said. It... What you looking at? That roulette wheel on the table over there. Don't you get enough practice at the white buffalo? Don't strain yourself, Marshal. I won't. I'm not too much alive. But I once knew a croupier clever enough to spin the wheel so that the ball would drop in any slot he wanted. That would be pretty hard to prove, wouldn't it, Marshal? Yeah, it would. Now, you want that wound fixed? Uh-huh. I'll bite my lip real hard. Do that, Marshal. It's a nice pose. <laughs> I bit my lip, but all I got was a pain in my mouth. And I didn't need that. There was enough pain. It started when Greg put a scalpel against my shoulder, and it went on from there. It went on for a long time. Finally, everything gathered into focus. Keep that bandage dry, Marshal. You'll be all right. Thanks, Doc. What's your fee? This bullet. The one I took out of you. I want it as a souvenir of the time I saved a Marshal's life. You're welcome to it. Just tell me this. Do you know a girl named Tamar? A girl in the Bible had that name. Contuarius knew a girl named Tamar. Now he's dead. Contuarius dead? Well, I suppose somebody wanted him dead. Yeah. But stick around. I may want to talk to you again later. It's always a pleasure, Marshal. I'll be around. What are your plans? I'm going to take a killer. <laughs> With your shooting arm in a sling? I don't think so. I'll gamble on it, Greg. Want odds? I got up and left Greg's shack. Taking a killer needed a little preparation. And right now, preparation meant talking to Mrs. Contuarius. But something stopped me. 
It was the funeral Mrs. Contrarius was celebrating for her dearly departed. Somewhere, she'd found a black ostrich plume and pinned it to the donkey's head. The cart she always used was draped in banners of black silk that looked suspiciously like the shreds of an elegant petticoat. Three grinning Indian kids, maybe eight years old, were beating the drum, clapping the cymbal, playing a flute. The rear of the parade was brought up by a bunch of other Indian kids, looking solemn because their new shoes hurt. And on the cart, in an open pine box, lay Senor Contrarius. I looked inside. The Senor was still very aristocratic. I looked again, closer... Then I knew I just had to talk to Mrs. Contrarius. It was maybe an hour later when she drove up to the White Buffalo alone, her cart empty and stripped to the banners. She looked uncomfortable in her black cotton. Send me your good arm, Marshal. I don't want to rip this dress. Yes, ma'am. There you are. Nice funeral, ma'am. Thanks, Marshal. Kids behaved real nice, didn't they? Yeah. You've done a good job on them, ma'am. Thanks. You haven't been very successful, have you, Marshal? Maybe that's your fault. Maybe you haven't told me enough. About what? About Tamar and your husband, for instance. What about Tamar and my husband? This about them, ma'am. They were real good friends. That could be a reason for you to kill your husband. Could, Marshal, but it wasn't. Maybe he was killed because he found out who was cheating his wheel and you didn't. But I did. Then why don't you take him? You want me to take Greg Hagen? Greg, I don't believe it. If it's an honest man, as honest as you are, Marshal. Can you prove what you're saying? I don't know. But I'm sticking around to see if I can. And I'm sticking around to see if I can bring in a killer. Who is it? Maybe you. Maybe Greg. Maybe Booth, the man in the beaded jacket. <laughs> maybe even the girl named Tamar. Then come on in and have a drink. You look peaked. I followed her into the casino. In an hour, it began to fill up. I hid myself behind the stairs where I had a clear view of the roulette table and waited. About eight, she walked through the door. Tamar. Tamar, in a dress of red. Tamar, buckled with silver. She strolled over to the table and put some chips on the black as Greg spine. There was no sign of recognition between them. Seven black. Seven pays black. Hey, pay. I was on Place it. your bet. On the next spin, Tamar won again. Then she lost. She doubled her bets and won more times than she lost. After a while, she stopped playing colors and switched to single numbers. Thirty-five to one. She kept on winning, about one out of four. In an hour, there was roughly $20,000 stacked in front of her. And in an hour, there wasn't any doubt they were a team. And Greg was spinning a crooked wheel. Thirteen black. Thirteen pays. Black pays. Oh, well, you're lucky. You're very lucky tonight, Tamar. Tonight, senora. I am always lucky at your tables, no? Not as lucky as tonight. Sorry, men. This is a private table from now on. You all move over to the second row, right over there. Private table, senora? Yes, just you and this gentleman. Mrs. Contarius was playing it smart. The man she thumbed at over her shoulder was Booth in his beaded jacket. I could have made my move then, but I decided to wait for the piece to play itself out. Mrs. Contrarius was getting them all together, and this show was too good to spoil. Greg, Booth, and Tamar. This is my last spin. That's all right, Tamar. All Mr. Booth wants is just one spin. Right, Mr. Booth? Yeah, just one spin. With a little lady. But I was... Ah, Mr. Booth, huh? Yeah. Well... I suppose it is all right. Spin the wheel, Greg. We'll spin. Once more. Bueno. All of my money on number one. Number one, huh? That's a good number. Number one. I'll take 10,000 in gold on number one. Three red. Three pays, red pays. Greg! Why, you double-crossed me. I double-crossed you. It don't matter, Tamar. Greg didn't have a chance. The knife he tried to draw was hammered back by the bullets from Booth's gun. They tore through his hand and across his chest. Suddenly, his face changed. He looked young and hurt and ashamed of the blood that he couldn't hold back. Booth held his guns like they were dogs on a leash that could snap easy. Keep back. All of you. Marshal. You can quit playing possum now. 
It'd make me real happy if you try to follow it. Pick up the money and let's go, Samar. Nobody move! <laughs> Nobody move! You let him get away, Marshal. I don't think so, ma'am. He'll be wanting to finish me off. I'm going to give him his chance. I could have looked for him in a lot of places. But he was with Tamar. That narrowed it down. There was only one place to look. It was dawn when I found him, resting easy in the cottonwood clearing. <laughs> I knew you'd have to come after me, Marshal. You know, you're funnier than an actor I saw once in Dodge. You're much funnier. Maybe you laugh too easy, Booth. Like you kill too easy. <laughs> the marshal with his gun arm in a sling chasing a killer. Go away, <laughs> Marshal. Go away while there is still time. I got nothing but time. I'll wait. That's where you're wrong, Marshal. You got no time at all. Yeah? Because if I do not believe, it is impossible that someone could shoot faster than say your book. But with your left hand. Oh, Chico. You are so very quick with your gun. I like that about a man. Take it easy, Tamar. Come on, let's go. Go? Oh, not now, Marshal. There is time. <laughs> Sit here next to Tamar. Like this? Mm-hmm. You know what I think? Oh, Chico. Chico, do not talk now. I think you had a great thing with Greg. He could put that ball in any number you bet on. Only that wasn't enough for you. Oh, but it does not matter now, Carito. You thought you could double your profits by throwing in with Booth. Maybe you were going to double cross him, too. Like your double cross contrarious and gray. Oh, do not worry about it, Chico. The money is yours, too. It belongs to Mrs. Contrarious. And that's who's going to get it. What? What are you talking about? Take your choice. Come back with me to the jail and gouge eye, or I'll turn you over to Mrs. Contrarious. And I don't think she could stand having you alive. Why, you. Oh, Chico, surely. Surely you are playing with me, huh? You murdered a man, Tamar. Chico. You killed Contuarius. Chico, I told you the shot that killed Contuarius came from the woods in back of the clearing. Much closer than that. From your gun, Tamar. Contuarius had powder burns on his forehead. So that shot was fired from up close. I saw that when I looked into his coffin. Powder burns from your gun, Tamar. We will go away together. You and I, Chico. Listen to me, Chico. Contuarius found out you were double-crossing him with Greg, didn't he? You listen to me. Let's go, Tamar. Listen, listen to me, Chico. There is plenty of money. Yours and mine. Listen to me, Chico. She put her arms around my neck and her lips close to my ear. And for a long time, for a long, long time, first in English, then in Spanish, then in Cherokee, and in a language I couldn't recognize, she whispered at me every foul name in the book. She was talented. She didn't repeat herself once. Tamar didn't understand that a marshal had a job to do, and that the job got... On the way back to Dodge City, I came across a cottonwood clearing I'd never noticed before. I rode down into it. Small animals scurried off a log and lost itself in the shadows. Then I was alone. For a time after that, for a long time after that, I thought about Tamar. They'd given her her guitar, but I knew she wouldn't be singing much longer. The rest of the way home, the country was dust got inside of my mouth, and it stayed there. Gunsmoke featured Howard Culver as Mark Dillon. Supported by June Foray, Gerald Moore, Vic Perrin, Jack Crucian, D.J. Thompson, and Jay Novello. Music was composed and conducted by Del Castillo. The original story by Morton Fine and David Friedkin was directed by Richard Sandville. This is Alan Botzer to Gunsmoke and another thrilling adventure with Mark Dillon, 
United States Marshal. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs> 